and one of the topics we studied last Wednesday was anger. Um, Proverbs contains lots of instructions concerning right living, wisdom, justice, temperance, industry, purity, and so forth, using contrasting comparisons, wisdom versus folly, and righteousness versus sin, and that kind of thing. And uh, if our identity is in Christ, we will be finding ourselves utilizing and uh, putting into action um, the right living parts that it mentions in Proverbs. And so uh, today, or tonight I should say, we will uh, study God's viewpoint in regards to correction of children. And then we'll go on to some other things. There, There's no particular order. It's just these are different topics I found that, and they're all throughout the Bible, but we're, we're focusing more on Proverbs right now. <clears throat> so if y'all would turn to Proverbs 13 and verse 1. Um, and, uh, if we'll do it like we usually do, <coughs> we'll do Dave, uh, from the King James Version, and Josie from the Living Word Bible, and then, uh, I'm going to change and not do Amplified tonight, I'm just going to do the NIV, uh, so, um, let's do Chapter 13 in Proverbs in verse 1. Mr. Dave. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Okay, Josie. A wise youth accepts his father's rebuke. A young mocker doesn't. Okay. Now they're almost alike. Mine's a wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a mocker does not listen to rebuke. So, whether we're talking about our own kids or whether we're talking about ourselves when we were kids, we can figure out whether we were, just by this verse alone, uh, we can notice whether we've been a wise son or whether we've been a mocker. And... Um, <clears throat> Parents were given to us by God to represent him to their children. And uh, their job is to give them instruction in what is right and what is wrong. Now, I do want to make a comment that if the parents the, of the parents didn't instruct their kids in right and wrong, it's a big possibility that the parents won't. But when people are serving the Lord and yield them to the Lord and they have children, they will do their best to give their children proper instructions so that they can know right from wrong and it's a good foundation for them in the start of their life at the beginning when they're old enough to understand anything. So um, anybody else got a comment on that? Dave, you got a comment on that? Nope. Okay. All right. The next one I wanted to look at is in ver chapter 19. No, 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 no. Take it back. Let's stay in 13 a minute. There's one in 13. Uh, 13 verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Okay, Josie. If you refuse to discipline your son, it proves you don't love him. 
For if you love him, you will be prompt to punish him. Okay. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Any comments? Well, uh, my comment is a few years ago, uh, and it still continues, there was um, a lot of concern about child abuse. And we as human beings tend to go from one extreme to another. And discipline does not always involve spanking. But even if it does, the spanking should be administered out of love, not out of anger. It should be used more to give att get attention, get the child's attention off of other things and get them onto the problem they're trying to solve. But it's not necessary in every case. And my mother proved that to me because I, I got a couple of spankings when I was younger uh, in grade school, but they were administered in love by my mother she never let any of her discipline reflect off of her emotions of, of anger or disgust or any of that um she just kind of treated it as a matter of fact you messed up and this is what's going to happen if uh because of, this is the result of that and if you keep messing up it's you're going to have a uh, more severe discipline and um, at the beginning, she did start out with spankings given because I was young and I didn't understand very much. And the spankings was, I understood hurt. And so she give, would give me a spanking. It wasn't a very hard, bad one, but it got my attention and it didn't feel good. And that's what she wanted to get across to me was when you do wrong, the consequences of that don't feel good. And that should be, I mean, I really feel like that was a good a good way to look at God's correction of us. He wants us to realize that when we do wrong, it's not good for us. And it will co has consequences that could be very bad for us. And that we need to choose, we have two choices, do right or do wrong. And we need to choose right because when we choose right, we don't have disciplinary f results of that. So coming from that kind of an approach, you don't have problems with child abuse because child abuse happens when our temper, our anger, <coughs> controls what we say and do. And we are out of control. A parent out of control needs time out, just like a child out of control needs time out. And that's a good time to send everybody to their respective rooms to think about it first. And, and then after everybody cooled down, you know, then deal with the problem. But the correction needs to have the goal of causing the person being disciplined to turn away from their wrongdoing and to do right, regardless whether it's being whether there's any p literal physical pain attached to it or not. Some kid, uh, I remember uh, a couple of my kids, actually, they thought my little sermonettes were more per uh, were more painful than a spanking, and they told me they wished I'd just given them a spanking because <laughs> it didn't last very long, the spanking. But my sermonettes, well, you all know how wordy I can get. Anyway, um, that was pure torture to them. <laughs> so, you know, you just have to kind of use your judgment um, as a parent, which we don't always make the right decisions in our judgments, but um, hopefully we learn and learn to do it the right way after we have found out the wrong ways. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, if we love our children, we won't let them continue doing wrong things that can hurt them or as they get older result. You know, some things kids do when they're little look kind of cute. Um, 
I remember watching a parent one time who just started laughing because their little two-year-old was throwing a temper tantrum. Well, you shouldn't laugh at that because that's feeding that that bad action. That's making it to where the kids think, oh, I get attention when I throw a temper tantrum. So then another uh, parent that I saw, they ignored their child when it had a temper tantrum, and I thought, well, they're not doing anything. But they had realized uh, over a period of time that the temper tantrums that child was throwing was meant to get attention. When they finally got it through their head, they weren't going to get attention by throwing a temper tantrum. They quit doing it. So it may have taken them a while because they got away with it for a while. But after a while, they figured that out. So, you know, a person just has to uh, ask God to give them the wisdom to know exactly how to uh, get their child to go the right way. <laughs> but if they don't do anything at all, then they're just... Like, the one who was laughing at the child gave the child attention and didn't do anything to correct it at all, whereas the one who ignored the temper tantrum was afterwards, when the child calmed down, let them know that you talk to me and you tell me what you want. You don't go throwing a temper tantrum. You're not going to get what you're wanting if you're throwing a temper tantrum. And so... There was a little, there was a difference there, but the one who just laughed, she wasn't laughing so well when her child got older and started doing things that she was not supposed to because when they got to a certain age, those things weren't cute anymore. Those things were not uh, funny anymore, you know, uh, to the parent, but at the age when they were learning, they learned it was funny, and so they thought it was funny. So then it took a lot longer to change that child's thinking on what was acceptable and what wasn't. So, Okay, now let's go to chapter 19 in Proverbs. And we're going to go to verse 18. Mr. Dave? Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Okay, I like that version. <laughs> Discipline your son in his early years while there is hope. If you don't, you will ruin his life. Okay. And in the uh, NIV, it says, Discipline your son for there, that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. Well, it is a, a death if, if uh, you don't correct the wrong and he keeps doing wrong because his wrongs will become worse, right? I like the the other two versions, the way they read uh, Dave's um, King James and Josie's Living Bible. I liked that ver those two versions better than mine. But um, either way, it shows you that if you let it go and you don't do something about it, you're not showing that you love your kid because love wants the best for your child and wants your child to learn right from wrong. Any other comments? Nope. Okay. All right. Now let's go to chapter 22. And verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay, Josie. Teach a child to choose the right path, and when he is older, he will remain upon it. Mm -hmm. 
Mine's almost like Dave's. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Any comments? Well, my comment is pretty much it well it's it, it pretty much says it all right then. And you think, well, what about the kids that have been taught the right way to go and in their teenage years they go the opposite direction? Well, maybe that's why it's got a comma in well on mine it's got a comma in the original they don't have the punctuation marks anyway um first it talks about train a child in the way they should go so a child speaks to somebody who's immature and doesn't know what's right and what's wrong and you have to teach him this okay and then when he's old he will not return i mean he will turn from it wait a minute when he is old, he will not turn from it, from the teaching, the proper teaching. So um, after he gets done going through his rebellious teenage stage, he comes to, he should, if he's maturing like he should, um, go back to doing that which is right. Um, teenagers lots of times are testing the waters they're declaring their independence and sometimes their way of doing it is going the opposite direction from where their parents are trying to train them but as they get older and wiser they see their parents had the right idea in the first place um, reminds me of cat I have uh, lots of cats at my house let's just put it that way some are mine and some belong to my daughter um, but they have a teenage personality, in my t my opinion, because you try. They're not obedient. Like a dog, you can teach them to be obedient, but a cat, lots of times, um, you'll like try to get them to come sit in your lap or come when you call them to eat or whatever. And there's some of the cats will obey and some of them won't and some of them obey part of the time and don't obey the other part of the time and you can just tell by the way they're acting that they think it's supposed to be their idea and if it's not their idea they're not going to do it <laughs> so see that's why i think they're they're teenagers <laughs> teenagers at heart even the older cats have their mo their moments like that but um but our kids are not cats and so after they go through that rebellious experimentation stage, uh, they should come to their uh, senses after that. Because you, if you give them a good foundation be of teaching on right and wrong, they should finally realize, I'm not letting somebody else control me. This is just the right way to go. <laughs> All right, let's... Move on down to verse in the same chapter, 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. <coughs> A youngster's heart is filled with rebellion, but punishment will drive it out of him. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Any comments? Mm. That oh, go ahead. Um. Yeah, it's, it's too late for correction now. Um, <clears throat> usually that's a... Uh, all that we're talking about is based on uh, a uh, people or a country that follows those things from the beginning. But... Uh, here in America, since the 60s, 
it has been gone down since. Mm. No more, no more Bible in the schools. Um, if you, if you try to raise your children today, you're sending them to a government education system that is contrary to everything that you're doing. Everything that, that is contrary in this, in this Bible that we're reading tonight, it's contrary. And if you look outside, or you look, look anywhere you, you know, all, all, these, uh, all these kids that go to school, I wouldn't say all of them, but the majority of, th of them have no clue anymore, and uh, they're wearing uh, earrings and tattoos and you name it, and tradition, the tradition of tattoos and earrings is slavery, and today they think it's cool. <laughs> they don't realize that they're they have made made themselves slaves for the system that we're in, we're uh, we're all living for this uh, system that we're in, and uh, so so now it's going to take more than raising your kids properly to get the country back on track. Right now, without God. Um, you know, we're in trouble. Amen. That's true. Okay. Let's go to chapter 23 for our last one in regards to the kids here. Um, and look at verses 13 and 14. Without, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Okay. People misunderstand that lots of times, and they go to an extreme, which gets us in trouble with uh, abuse. Um But we need to have some discipline taught to our children. And if you have to get their attention by giving them a swat on the rear, um, as long as you're not being abusive uh, with it uh, and you're applying it in the right out of love and not out of anger, um, it should teach him things that will keep him out of trouble and so um, that's what I read into it um, my mind said uh, I didn't let Josie read hers sorry don't fail to correct your children discipline won't hurt them they won't die if you use a stick on them punishment will keep them out of hell and mine says, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. So when you do it correctly, whether it's something you use that causes them a tiny bit of pain to get their attention or, or not, uh, it should teach them right from wrong. And, of course, if it causes them, like, where it goes into child abuse is when it's uh, applied with the wrong attitude. Instead of with love, it's out of anger and, and emotion. And when it's out of emotion, <clears throat> it can easily get out of control 
and cause physical damage like broken bones and stuff. Uh, the one, even though it sounds pretty rough in some of our translations, um, it's meant to get attention. It's not meant to do permanent damage. Um, so when it does some kind of permanent damage, uh, it's not getting attention. It's just being abusive. And if it's not administered with the right attitude of love, if it's administered with attitude of anger, it's not only physically harmful, but it's mentally harmful. And that's one way to tell the difference. You don't want to do something that's mentally harmful. Because um, mental abuse and physical abuse, they're both wrong. <laughs> and there's no excuse for abuse. No. All right, um, let's go to another topic. This one was labeled in my Thompson Chain reference as tempters. So let's go to chapter 4 and verse 14 and see what it says. Yeah, this is all going to be in Proverbs, so we're not dumping around right now. We're just kind of sticking with, to see what Proverbs says. There's other places in scriptures that talk about these topics, but I wanted to just kind of zero in on Proverbs, uh, and then further study can be done at a later time if, if someone wants to do it. Um, but um, chapter 4 and verse 14 Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Don't do as the wicked do. <laughs> okay. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked, or walk in the way of evil men. So, avoid temptation because the ones with evil intent will cause you to be tempted. If you hang around them, they'll, they'll try to tempt you into doing the wrong thing. So, and I guess we should have started with 13. Um, because in mine it says, hold on to instruction, do not let go. Guard it well, for it is your life, which is the opposite of the 14. So that's, um, I don't know if that's what you all said. Dave, how does yours say that, say it in, in verse 13? Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Okay, and Josie, what does yours verse 13 say? Carry out my instruction. Don't forget them, for they will lead you to real living. Okay, so you'll have a better life if you do it God's way. And good parents will try to teach their children to do it God's way. Okay. Now let's go to chapter 9. Okay. This is talking about a tempter. Hmm. Let's see. When we're tempted to do different things, it's wrong, I guess. Um, let's let's start with verse ten, and let's 
go to verse 18. So 10 through 18. We'll let Dave go first. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou sh shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. A foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple, and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she th saith unto him, Stone waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Okay, Josie, 10 through 18 in chapter 9, please. For the reverence and fear of God are basic to all wisdom. Knowing God's God results in every other kind of understanding. I wisdom will make the hours of your day more profitable and the years of your life more fruitful. Wisdom is its own reward, and if you scorn her, you hurt your only yourself. A prostitute is loud and brash and never has enough of lust and shame. She sits at the door of her house or stands at the st street corners of the city, whispering to men going by and to whosoever is simple. Let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. Okay, and the NIV says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through me your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. The woman folly is loud. She is undisciplined and without knowledge. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come in here. She says to those who lack judgment, Stolen water is sweet, food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of the grave. Definitely a temptress. Mm -hmm. She's a tempter. <coughs> Any comments? Uh, the, yeah. Uh the simple <coughs> in the Webster's Dictionary is talking about um, lacking in worldly wisdom or informed judgment um, you know naive uh, uncritical unknowing uh, you know so it's like there's a lot of people who don't know a lot of things and you know they they would rather believe that everybody is honest or trusting or whatever so they haven't they haven't uh learned uh from anybody from those situations and uh, so if you don't have any relatives or you don't have any parents to tell you, you're going to grow up not knowing a whole lot of things, how things are done or how people, how other people live. Um, 
you know, it's, you need these things if you if you're going to be uh, be in business in the business world, or else you're going to be taken advantage of, and you're going to not prosper. Well, it tells us in the Bible to seek knowledge and seek understanding, and when we don't, then we are led astray easily, and then we fall into all these dangerous. Uh, ways and behaviors and things that are not good for us and um, so we we fall into temptation we fall for the tricks of the devil we're not uh, wise enough to recognize that that's not a good thing so um, yeah we we've got to uh, study to show ourselves approved and we've got to um, learn from those who are wise and not be paying any not not trusting those who are not wise to lead us in the direction we should go all right uh let's try one more this is in chapter 16 And verse 29. And we're, we're talking about tempters. A violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. Okay. Josie? Sixteen twenty nine. Would this be it? Wickedness loves company and leads others into sin. I couldn't hear you very good. Wickedness loves company and leads others into sin. Would that be it? Yeah, that that mm -hmm. should be it. Yeah. And mine's almost like what Dave read in the King James uh, Version. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him down a path that is not good. Some, you know, just like Satan tempted Eve, he made doing wrong looked, he, caught, he tricked Eve into believing that the wrong thing was the right thing, was better for her. A tempter does that, and a violent man or a man who's wicked, wicked man, um, he tries to get other people to f do some of the same things he's doing, and he tries to make it look good. He's uh, a superb, I guess you would say, liar and salesman trying to com convince people that wrong is right and right is wrong and he has things that he does or says to convince them of that and he gets them into trouble <laughs> so um, no the Lord's Prayer tells us to, to, we ask God to lead us not into temptation because there's all kinds of temptations there's all kinds of tricksters in the world, and um, that's why we need to study God's Word so that we are aware of right and wrong in a way where these tricksters can't have any control over any of us. And just constantly be in the Word and be prayerful that God will lead and direct us and guide us in the right ways. Okay, um, I think I was tempted to do one more, but let me see if I've got one that's shorter, because this next one I had written down is a long, uh, has a whole bunch of verses to read, and um, we did take up <coughs> some of our normal study time with prayer 
So I'm thinking we could maybe do one more if I can find one that doesn't have so many verse, uh, verses to check on. Let me see. Um, let's do f uh, what Proverbs, let's check on what Proverbs says about friendship. Okay, uh, let's do... Let's go to Proverbs chapter 17. And we want, oops, wrong page. We want verse 17. So chapter 17 and verse 17. A friend loveth all, uh, let me start over, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Okay, now we're talking about friendship. Uh, Josie, how's yours reading? A true friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. Okay, and mine says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for advers adversity. Sounds to me like well, it sounds like one is um, got their a good friend is is a, one who l is a friend wants what's best for you that shows for God's love, whereas. Somebody who I, I I'm not real sure. Well, you when you really need a friend, they're there. Yeah, they'll do it whether they're they kind of lay down whatever they're doing and go help you. Right, like, you know, right then. But someone who's not well, it does say there's a friend in another scripture. There's a friend that's closer than a brother. Well, your brother might be related to you by blood. But that doesn't mean he's got your best interest at heart. So a friend has your best interest for uh, has your best interest at heart, and a blood uh, brother um, can be a friend also and have your best interest at heart. So uh, I think they just used those terms to help differentiate between them, but. Um, we can see the difference, you know, if 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 someone's trying to get us to do wrong things, they're not being a friend. Uh, it's like when my kids were teenagers, there were times when some of their so-called friends were always getting them into trouble, and they didn't like it when I told them they needed to change their friends. So that's not a friend. That's someone to hang with, but they're tr they're leading you in wrong directions. A friend, a true friend, will want what's good for you. They'll want good things to happen to you, not bad things. So, all right. Um, let's go to chapter eighteen. And verse twenty four. Eighteen twenty four. Yes. Proverbs. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Okay, Josie. There are friends who pretend to be friends, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And mine says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
So that kind of indirectly tells me that having lots of friends is not necessarily a good thing. It'd be better to have one friend who really acts like a friend and sticks close to you and tries to help you do good than to have a whole bunch of so-called friends who are trying to persuade you to do the wrong things. Kind of like these gangs out there. They, they get together and they influence each other to do wrong things instead of right things. Okay, uh, another one in regards to friendship is in chapter 19. That tells about friendships uh, in verse 4. Wealth maketh many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Okay, Josie. A wealthy man has many friends, the poor man has none left. Wealth brings many friends, but a poor man's friend deserts him. Any comments on that? I know I have some, but... I think if I were writing this, um, when I put the poor man's friend deserts him, I might put parentheses around the word friend and also around the friends about wealth because when people are rich, you have a lot of fake friends who are just there because you have money, but if something happened and you were to lose your money, all of a sudden they don't want to be around you. Because what they were really around you for was what they could get out of you wealth-wise. And then the poor man doesn't have very many friends because he has nothing for them to get out of him. So if he has a true friend instead of a fake friend, they will be a friend who cares about him and wants what's best for him, not what they can get out of him. It's the way I, I understand it, but it's, I mean, that's the way I understand it. So, depends on the intentions of the so-called friend. <laughs> All right, let's go to chapter 27 and verse 10. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy neighbor's house in the day of thy calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than our brother far off. Okay, Josie. Never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. Then you won't need to go to a distant relative for help in your time of need. And the NIV says, do not forsake your friend and the friend of your father. And do not go to your brother's house when desire, disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a fa brother far away. Any comments? Dave, I think you and Josie's translations were a little easier to understand on that one. They pretty much spoke for themselves. Um, okay, and then one more. Verse, uh, same chapter, 27, and verse 17. Iron sharpeth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Okay. 
What's your say, Miss Josie? Well, <laughs> it might be this. Friendly discussion is stimulating as the sparks that fly when iron strikes iron. Okay, mine's as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I, I don't know if this is how you take that to mean, but I take it that a, f a friend, a good friend, is good for you, and you're good for them. If you have any cons uh, complaints or criticisms or whatever, they are healthy ones meant to help one another. They're not meant to tear each other down. Now, I don't know if that's how you take it. If you have any other well, thoughts. You have the same interest in talking and you can strike a good conversation. That ha well, that's a good way to look at it, yeah. <laughs> well, there's also, there's also influence. Because it's uh, sharpening, sharpeneth, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So um, the, the, the good influence will influence the other to do good in, in areas that are needed to be, you know, I mean. I like that, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there might be a lot of um, similarities, that's why they're friends, but then when it comes to certain issues and stuff, there might be a difference there, so. A friend will help the other to make the right choices. Sounds good to me. Yeah, that's good. They'll be beneficial to each other. <laughs> help keep each other on the straight and narrow path. <laughs> All right, let's go to one more topic. Divine knowledge. Uh, let's go to chapter 15. And verse 11. right yeah this is divine knowledge yeah hell and destruction are before the Lord how much more than the hearts of the children of men okay the depths of hell are open to God's knowledge how much more the hearts of all mankind and mine's kind of like Dave's death and destruction lie open before the Lord how much more the hearts of men so God knows all. He knows what's in our heart. So, um, that's kind of how I take it. Any other comments? Okay, let's go to... Where to go? All right, chapter 21 and verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. We can justify our every need, but God looks at all mo our motives. And all a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. So, <coughs> divine knowledge, the divine knowledge of God, uh, sees deeper inside of us than we see inside of each other is the way I kind of take it. <coughs> okay, let's do one more verse on divine knowledge. It's 
Let's go to chapter 24 and verse 12. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the hearts consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Okay, Josie. Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand back and let them die. Don't try to disclaim responsibility by saying you didn't know it, didn't know about it. For God who knows all hearts knows your yours, and he knows you knew, and he will reward everyone according to his deed. Okay. If you say, we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Any comments? Well, to me, it's really t letting us know that we can fool each other, we can fool ourselves, but you can't fool God because he sees what's on our heart. And um, that kind of goes along with that song that uh, Chuck wrote about uh, the eyes of God are upon you. He sees, you know, because he... My, my mother taught me that at a very young age, uh, which kept me out of a lot of trouble. She said, you can hide stuff from me, but you cannot hide it from God. He's everywhere, and he sees all, and he knows all, and he knows what's in your heart. He knows what your intentions were, whether they were good or bad. He knows whether your actions are good or bad. And he knows even if nobody else saw, he knows. And that's kind of how I take that in a nutshell. <laughs> Any more comments anywhere? Because if not, we're going to call that good and let you go a little bit early. Um, unless you want to do one more topic, which I've got another topic here that doesn't have a whole lot of verses with it, if you'd rather just speak up and let me know. Uh, Josie's worked all day, and, and it's a good possibility that Dave has too, so I'll kind of figure you probably are blessed when I let you go early sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but you can always speak up and say, oh, let's do one more. <laughs> You're good? Okay. All right. Um, well, does anybody else have any other um, prayer requests? that we didn't already cover. <laughs>